Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Tonight I bring you some of the latest reports that have come in over the last few weeks. We research all and every unexplained event here at BBR, as you will see, as I take you on a journey across the UK. The shadowing thing, Bluebell Hill. I was contacted by a gentleman who lives very close to the Bluebell Hill area of Kent. And as we know, there are a number of cases of a strange, tall, hairy ape-like figure that's been seen numerous times between 1946 and 1990. It's normally seen on and around the hill. Each witness described the something that they saw as a cross between a human and an ape. Witness report. A few days ago, my neighbour and I were chatting and passing the time of day when we got chatting about the strange reports on the hill. I explained the weird ape man reports and my neighbour explained that he too had a really strange experience on Bluebell Hill many years ago. He went on to explain that he was walking from the top of Bluebell Hill down to the village using a path that leads from the lookout point at Bluebell Hill down to the Pilgrim's Way. He was out late, it was around midnight, and he was alone. He explained this was when his children were very young, so he could estimate the time would have been around 25, 30 years ago now. That night, as he was walking, he suddenly felt alert, and he had the sensation that something was watching him. He said he felt afraid for his own safety that night. He couldn't shake the gut feeling that he was not alone, and he was possibly in danger. He looked around the area in the hopes of seeing what was watching him, but he couldn't see anything in the darkness. He said he heard the sound of wood snapping, like a small branch being broken as something moved within the shrubs and bushes. He then quickened his pace and said he felt that something was shadowing him within the woods and that whatever it was, it was crashing through the undergrowth noisily along beside him as he moved away. At that point, he broke into a sprint, going down along the pathway towards the Pilgrim's Way. Whatever it was following him, he didn't see it, but it kept pace with him all the way down to the roadway. Now, my neighbour's local to the area, and he knows the normal sounds of nature. It was a route he'd taken many times before, but he did not recognise what was making all that noise that night. He said it sounded as if it was big, and powerful. And from that point on, the remainder of his walk home was uneventful. He did add that Bluebell Hill is also known for UFO and paranormal events that have taken place there over the years. There happens to be a tunnel cut into the chalk that runs parallel with the pathway that my neighbour was walking along. You can find the entrance to this tunnel in an old chalk quarry and it runs for 500 metres parallel to the pathway that you can see directly between two chalk pits or quarries. Now, our next report comes from an area not too far away from me, actually. Um, and it's the Crompton Bigfoot. Hello, Deborah. I'm not sure if this is relevant to what you saw all those years, years ago, but I thought you may want to hear it. I originally come from Liverpool and I lived in Brighton for years and I now live on the Wirral. I was brought up in the 1970s in a place called Bowering Park. I remember as a girl hearing local people talk about this Neanderthal man who bizarrely is always spotted by the same bridge in a place called Cronton, which is semi-rural and in Widnes. Exactly the same description that you gave when you saw your monster. She said, last year I couldn't believe it when I was lying in bed listening to one of Tom Sleeman's audio books and I again heard that very story about the Cronton Bigfoot. Apparently, she said, it's not even appearing to be that elusive because the canal bridge it is always seen by is right next to a country pub, which just seems ridiculous, I know. Well, I'd still want to investigate this. I might see if uh, Mick fancies having a ride out there and having a look because if it, the locals are speaking about it, it's come from somewhere, there will be a grain of truth in it. So if anyone out there knows any information on the Cronton Neanderthal man, 
I would be grateful if you get, get in touch using one of the links below. A strange series of clicks. This happened in spring of this year. Hi, I should start by saying, although though I've had many paranormal experiences throughout my life, I always try to rationalise them. And I would say that I deal in fact. I've lived rurally all my life and I've camped and hiked for over 20 years. I've had plenty of creepy experiences, but none compared to my experience that happened a few weeks ago when I visited the woods. I've locked all the doors in the house now because of that event and all the rooms. The woods have not been the same for me since this happened. I had argued with my partner and I'd left to go for a walk to calm down. We live in a very rural area and it's heavily wooded. It's extremely steep and it's made up of mostly old woodlands that can't be felled due to preservation laws. It's a lonely place and it's on its own along the coast and it's basically way too steep for anyone or anything to climb it. The land is beautiful. It's filled with streams, caves and rocks. I love the woods, the solitude. It always made me happy and calm, like everything will be okay. It's my go-to place with my dog. I love this area. I've taken so many walks here over the years. I know it like I know my own hand. I should explain that my dog will never leave my side. She's got separation issues. So if I leave, she leaves with me. She'll do whatever she can do to get to me. I cannot stress that enough. This night, I walked off to chill out with my dog and I expected her to follow me as usual. She wouldn't come. Now this is a dog who has physically injured herself to get through a gate to get to me. But that night, she stayed at the gate whining. I have to say at that point, I was pretty hurt, thinking, great, even my dog don't want to come out with me. And I started up the road thinking she would come along behind, but she never did. That is not her usual behaviour. She never passes up a chance to get out or on a deer chase. I walked to the road a few bends up and I stopped to catch my breath. I felt kind of odd. I can't explain it, so I just took it off. And it was because I had no dog with me. I walked a bit more up the lane and I had just had this terrible feeling come over me really quickly. And I felt like I wasn't alone. It's hard to describe, but I heard the sound of movement above me. And you have to understand that this old road runs through a very steep, wooded area. And it was late at night and it was very dark. As I was standing there frozen, I heard a very loud series of clicks. They were extremely loud, like nothing I'd heard before. It was like when a person is clicking with their mouth. I can't explain it. There was a pattern to it. Four loud clicks from above, one after the other, like in a line. And then one sounded below me on the other side of the road, going down into the valley. They were so close, so loud. The only way I can describe it was a very deep fear. I felt surrounded. It was terrifying. I could see nothing in the dark, but I knew I had to get out of there. I felt like I'd interrupted something, like I'd walked into a situation and I was not welcome. I ran back down the road and home as fast as I could. I told my partner and we locked all of the doors. I know this patch of wood is a game trail. I can't walk anywhere without bumping into a deer, but what I heard was not a deer. It will no, I will no longer walk at night, even if someone comes with me. The sense of threat has terrified me. I no longer feel like the woods I love is safe. Now, I spoke to our witness on the phone at length and she asked me if they would come to the house. And I can't blame her. She must have been absolutely terrified. She stressed that she had no idea what they were. That's just how she phrased it. I explained that I felt she'd walked into a situation without realising as the dog was clearly picking up on something that kept her in that night. We just don't know what made the clicking noise or why. Sadly, this lady is sold up and moved back to town. This incident has robbed her of her freedom and the wild places that she loves. I noticed this report happened in spring and there are other reports close by where a werewolf or a dog-like creature has been seen 
usually draw in spring. And one of those places is the is Linton, uh, the Linton Werewolf. There were a number of reports in the 1990s from the Linton area, from locals who described seeing an upright wolf-like creature. A woman walking home after dark reported seeing a hair-covered creature, which she described as a grey man with a wolf's head, and it was apparently stalking a large rabbit. The creature vanished when disturbed by a stag that ran out from a nearby wooded area. Not too far away, we have the whistling ape of 2013. While driving to work one morning, I turned the corner and the car lights captured a large ape-like thing stepping out onto the road. When it spotted me, it stepped backwards and it moved off back into the woods. I didn't know what to think and I still don't. And then, about a month ago, I was running through the woods when I heard a whistle that came from just off the track. When I stopped to have a look, I heard another whistle just above me on the other side of the track. And at this point, I got a little freaked out. So I moved on at speed, and I think the two events have got me wondering what could be out there. Well, we can't blame him for that, can we? We just listen to the reports that we've just done. They're so varied and, and so different, each one unique, but all terrifying in their own way. This next report is called The Ribchester Thing. Now, this is from one of our YouTube view viewers. Oh, I couldn't get that out then. This is from one of our YouTube viewers, and his handle is Baby with a Laser. And he says, Hi, Deb. I was listening to your podcast the other day. And something you said struck a chord with me. Me and my wife rented a holiday home for a week in June last year and it was just outside Ribchester in the northwest of England. And one night I was sitting in the kitchen of the holiday home when the whole house began to shake. It shook, each shake accompanied by a deep throbbing noise. At first I thought it was the freezer making this weird din. So I stood up and I leant on the freezer to stop the shuddering. But it wasn't the freezer. And it was getting louder. I darted outside and the noise was definitely coming from above us. I guess it was not more than about 50 feet above the house. But I couldn't see whatever was making the noise at all. I ran the, ran the side of the house to see if anything slow and heavy was rumbling up the lane. I saw now there was nothing moving out there. It also dawned on me that there had been a burst pipe in the lane just outside the house. And that had been dug up that day and taped off. So only cars could just about squeeze through. I have no doubt what... I have no idea what could be making that noise. I haven't heard it since. Now, the sound, he said, slowly passed overhead and it seemed to follow the direction of the lane and it was heading south towards Ribchester village. The noise appeared to stop at one point and it seemed to be coming back our way, but it just faded after a while until I could no longer hear it. He said, I've just Googled the lane, and eerily it's called Gallows Lane at Rear Ribchester. And it turns out there are a number of aerospace sites within about 10 miles of where we were staying. It turns out that there was one even closer to us with an airstrip at Mellabrook. Um, Salisbury Aerodrome is only about two or three miles south of where we were staying. He said, that's just blown me away. That sound travelled in that direction. I have no doubt of that at all. So you could possibly have heard, and this is just speculation on my part, maybe a weapons testing or something like that. He said, I would also like to make a report on behalf of my nephew. He was driving home from my house near Manchester Airport late one night and he was travelling down Roaring Gate Lane. As he went around a bend near the Davenport Green wedding venue, he was met by the alarming sight of a creature that he's struggling to name. He described what he saw as a giant rabbit that was the size of a Great Dane, and it was moving across the road. He was forced to ram his brakes on, but it was too late, and he braced for impact, as he was clearly about to hit this thing. He waited for the thud, but there was none, and he swears that he hit it. He drove off home shaken as he looked back and thought about it, he realised the creature appeared to have been transparent. I've been speaking to him recently and he took me through it and explained a few details that I didn't know. 
He said the thing was as high as his eye line and as wide, maybe a bit smaller than the width of his car. I also quizzed him on why he said it resembled a rabbit. And he told me it was shaped like a rabbit in that it was big and it had a large back end like a rabbit. Not that it had big ears or anything like that. He didn't really clock its face because it all happened so quick. And as he whipped around the bend, it was just crossing the road. Now, these new details also resemble the Tatton story of the guy that sits in his Jeep. And Tatton isn't that far from where he experienced it. And he's right, it does. There was a, a skulking creature of Tatton that crawled un, across the road on its belly. And the gentleman said it had arms and legs, but it had to be a cat because it couldn't have been anything else. I recently did a live stream discussing a number of strange paranormal and supernatural reports. One of our regular listeners within the chat and she reached out to me in email with some experiences that happened to her. And this is titled, Time is just a human made concept and it really doesn't run like we think. And the witness's name is Kelly Shaw and she was fine with me naming her and she said, hi Debs. I'm a regular listener to your show and I like to hear the experiences people send in to you. We chatted recently about the strange coincidence between the area of your sighting and the report of the strange white being at Withenshaw Hall. I'm researching as much as I can on the case online for you and I'll be in touch as soon as I have new information. I've included some experiences that I had some years ago now. I lived in Manchester when this first event happened on an ordinary estate and this experience took place in 2002 and it was the hottest of July days and we'd reached 94 degrees that day and by the night time it had only cooled a little. It was still about 84. I couldn't sleep that night and although I had to work at 9am the next morning I was still up around 2am. I went upstairs, I opened the bedroom window, but it made no difference. There was no air moving. I lay on top of the covers in some light clothes and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't settle down to sleep. I tossed and turned until about 4am and then I gave up. And I started to read a book, hoping that that would help me to drift off. Around 4am, I heard a clopping sound. Clip, clop, clip, clop. And I wanted to know who was out on a horse at that time in the morning. So I got up and I looked outside my window. It was daylight by now and I had a clear view of a figure, a woman. I couldn't see her clearly due to the hedges, but I could tell she was female. And she must be the one responsible for the clip-clop noise. I decided she must have been wearing heels and that was what I was hearing. It was a Tuesday morning, which seemed a strange time to be out dressed in heels. And she also had a warm winter jacket with a hood. And the hood was pulled tight, even in all this heat. I ducked inside so she wouldn't see me as she passed my home. Her clothing was really strange. And I realised she also had on warm trousers on what looked like hobnail boots. And it was these boots that made the click-clop sound. Her jacket had the old duffel jacket toggles and it looked very old fashioned. I stood where she could not see me and I thought, why would you be out on the hottest day of the year in midwinter clothing and footwear? As she neared my window, I could see her side on. Her hood was up and she was looking down as she walked. And then she stopped abruptly and she turned and she looked directly at me. I stepped backwards shocked. How did she know I was there? I saw her pale alabaster face and she had dark eyes and a thin mouth. And everything about her was off kilter to me and the hairs on my neck stood up. I suddenly thought, why am I hiding? She's the one who's weird. I marched back to the window and she was gone. She'd vanished. I would have heard her running away. I heard her approaching for long enough. She was nowhere to be seen. I knew all my neighbours and she was not one of them. And all of the homes had cast iron gates and you could hear them clang when people came through. I presume she somehow silently got into the garden and hid. I waited for her until about 5.30am. She didn't appear and I never saw her again. And I wondered if she had a skin condition and that was why she was bundled up. 
As I watched from the window hoping to see her, I saw two cats walk from both sides of the street. They met at the spot the woman had been standing when she was looking at me. I found that weird, as not only do cats not normally greet each other so well in the street, they were not cats that I could recognise. You get used to your neighbour's cats. I slammed that window shut, even in the heat. I just had visions of her flying into the window at me. I never slept a wink that night. I had to go to work the next day. But I did not. I did tell a few people, but they never believed me. Now, my second true story was a time slip. And I never knew what that meant until seeing a YouTube video on the subject. In the 1990, I was 18 and I was living in Manchester. My father was 61 at the time, was driving the car and I was the passenger. And this was in Burnage, South Manchester. It was an old barber shop run by a man the locals called Chop Off Charlie. He had dropped dead months earlier and his decrepit shop was closed. He had a rusty old grill which covered the window. And it was more like a metal fence and you could see through to the shop inside. That is, as if it wasn't still filled with old bags for sale and umbrellas. They were nicotine stained and they were filled the window top to bottom. Uh, not this night though. The shop had been sold and the rusty grill was gone, along with the crappy bags and the umbrellas. Instead, there was a new bay window and a single light bulb inside was replaced with a fluorescent light. Two men were decorating and it looked great. My dad had his eyes on the road, so I said, Dad, you can get your hair cut soon, as the barber's been bought. Great, he replied. Driving on the next night, I'm reading the evening news, and we get stuck in traffic outside the barber's. My dad nudges me and points at the shop and says, I thought you said it had been bought. I turned and looked at it, and it was still for sale. The new decoration, the bay window, and the new lights were all gone. The old rusty grills were still in place and the nicotine bags and umbrellas were still blocking the window. I couldn't understand it. Even the old window frame was back and rotting. I said, it was completely renovated yesterday. Sure, my dad replied. Three days later it was bought and a month after that it looked exactly how I saw it that night. That's why I think time is just a human made concept. And really, it doesn't run like we think. It's more like your layers. My third story happened when I was night fishing with a lad called Jeff. I was 15 and we were on the River Mersey in Didsbury, Manchester. As we fished in this field, it got really dark and a storm started to blow in. And it was wet, thundery and windy. And we stood out in it, but we left our rods nearby in case of lightning strikes. While the storm blew in, the horses under a nearby flyover where they were stable were whining and whinnying and making a racket. They obviously didn't like the storm. Well, we saw it out and that was about 2.45am. At 9am, a woman came across the field in my direction and she said, Excuse me, have you been here long? And I told her we'd been fishing all night and she asked me, Did you see or hear anything last night regarding the horses under the bridge? And I said when the storm came in at 2.45, they made a bit of a racket. And she said, did anyone pass you last night? And I said, no. And so did Jeff, who joined me. And she said, well, I got here this morning at 8am like usual. And the horses have been mutilated. Both of the horses had missing ears, tails and other wounds. And as you can imagine, we were shocked. We were sleeping very close when the attacks took place. Who would do something like that and during a storm? And they never did find out who or what did it. The last experience I want to share is very strange and it was related to me by my late father, but it involved my grandfather, my grandmother, my aunt and my uncle. My grandfather was called Herbert Coombs. He was in the Manchester Regiment at the Somme. He didn't speak about it, apparently because he lost all of his friends there. My nan was called Ada. My father was born in 1931 and he was one of 14 kids. This incident occurred before he was born in the early 1920s. My granddad had survived the Battle of the Somme, but he was also injured by shrapnel and he returned home with wounds. He had to find work regardless of this when he returned from the First World War. 
We became a window cleaner and he settled down in Stratford near the Bridgewater Canal. My grandparents lived in a terrace house with two kids at this point, Ken, age five, and Joyce, age four. Every night, the kids was rushed downstairs, claiming the wardrobe doors were opening and closing on their own. And as they screamed down the stairs, the next door neighbour would hammer on the wall due to the noise. This happened every night and my granddad would see them to bed and show them that there was no bogeyman in the wardrobe, but it didn't get better. Then the kids started running downstairs screaming, each saying something had ripped the blankets off the bed that they shared. Every night the wardrobe opened and the blankets went flying, but my grandparents didn't believe them. The neighbour kept hammering on the wall because of the noise and my granddad feared being reported and evicted. Seeing the kids to bed again, he went next door and he apologised saying the kids were playing up and that they'd been told to behave so you can stop knocking on the walls, it's driving us mad. And the old man replied, I thought it was you knocking. I thought the war had sent you by and had been too afraid to say anything. He said the noise was coming from the chimney stack they shared. My granddad went white. He suddenly realised there was actually something in the house. He came back in and he didn't tell my nan what the neighbour had said. He just assured her that everything would be fine. That night, with the kids finally asleep and my granny in bed, he sat downstairs by the coal fire. Suddenly, the room grew cold and he felt a presence behind him. And in broken English, a German voice said, I'm a German soldier, you shot in the war. Don't turn around because I'm not a pretty sight. But I just want you to know that I bear you no malice. My granddad was petrified and no way was he turning around. The German added, tomorrow night I will meet you here by the fire and shake your hand. And if you do this for me, then I'll go. And the room grew warm again and my granddad ran upstairs to cower under the covers. My granddad spent the night under the covers until daylight and the next morning, leaving everything behind, he moved them all out and into another house near Manchester United ground. He swore that if he'd met the German by the fire, then it would have been the last thing he ever did. Personally, I wonder if it was PTSD, but it doesn't explain the kids' wardrobes or the blankets being pulled off every night or the hammering in the walls. My father asked him years later if he could have killed a soldier. My granddad said, yes, I shot people in the German trenches. We all did. It was war. Not too far away, there's an area called the Countess of Chester Nature Reserve. And I received an email from a BBR member who experienced a really strange time slip when she was out walking with her partner. We've just this minute returned from our usual walk around the Countess Country Park and I've experienced something we simply cannot explain rationally. We were approaching the old Knolls Bridge above the canal path and we passed two girls strolling along chatting. I took a good look at them as we passed by as they caught my interest. We then took a swift ride up the short path and down under the bridge to join the canal. We noticed a young couple who were acting strangely. They were on their mobile phones and we motioned to pass them on the narrow path. We carried on walking down the long canal path, passing various people along the way. I looked up and I noticed in the distance the same two girls wandering along chatting. The same girls we'd seen coming this way when we were on the bridge. My partner also commented on this as we were stunned that they could have possibly somehow passed us without seeing them. There is no conceivable way or route that that they could have taken to get to that point. We scratched our heads trying to work out how. we Had we lost time? Would have been about five to ten minutes of time. That's the only explanation we have. We've discussed various possible scenarios, but nothing comes close. This is exactly the same area where I heard the growl that I reported to you the other day. And a dogman sighting has been seen near that very same bridge. My partner also pointed out that there was something very strange about the young couple who seemed out of place among the dog walkers and families in the general area. Was it a time slip? A portal? Had we jumped dimensions or something? In our next report, we hear from a chap who encounters something very strange whilst taking part in his Duke of Edinburgh award. 
I've taken two other reports from young men who had the strangest of experiences whilst orienteering. One chap was lucky, I say lucky, he had two friends with him, and they were given a set of coordinates and a time to be back at base. He set off to do just that, and halfway into the journey, they spotted something small and dark brown or black in colour, sitting close to them. There was a strange looking man. He was wearing strange clothing and he had, was the same colour all over. He had a small bow and tiny arrows in a sheath. And as the boys ran off, one of them was hit in his lower back. And when he turned to see what had hit him, he saw a tiny arrow ahead. Now the strange little man that had shot at them, he just was all one colour. Now the man still has that arrow head and it's in a leather pouch around his neck and it disappears from time to time, but it always returns unexpectedly, and I've actually seen it. I had it in my hand when we were at Canuck the first time we ever met there, um, and it was intricate. It was absolutely beautiful. The second chap I spoke to was learning to canoe, and he was not doing very well, and he lagged further and further behind these strong paddlers. Now, he still had his friends in sight, and there was a youth guide with them, and one a little bit behind for stragglers like him. As he turned a bend in the river, um, he was for a moment alone. He looked into the water and he saw a strange face looking back at him. Not a beautiful mermaid of myth, but a water hag of some kind. She was shriveled and rotten and she beckoned for him from the dark water. And he was absolutely frozen on the spot, which worked in his favour. As he was about to pass out with fear, the youth guide who was behind him, came up. And she, the hag, swam deeper into the darker part of the river. He told me, even though it was 25 years ago, he still does not walk near dark water alone. Our next witness encountered a very strange man indeed when he was with his friends um, that he met on the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme. He said, I'd like to tell you about something that happened to me back in the 90s. I was probably around 18 or 19 at the time. I used to go walking with a group of friends from school. Um, We'd all done our Duke of Edinburgh award scheme together and until we went to university, we still went walking together around the Greenfield area as it was easy to get to by bus from where we lived in Oldham. In fact, back then, an under 18's day saver was only a pound. I'd seen a route for a two-day backpacking trip um, in Trail Walker magazine that went from Greenfield to Crowden and back again, taking in a rock called a Trinicle on the last day. Now, the route also went past a memorial cross at Ashway Gap. The magazine explained that the memorial cross was in memory of an MP who was shot in 1857. So on that day, we walked around the reservoir, Duffstones, Yeoman Hay and Greenfield, and after a short scramble up Birch and Clough, we'd arrived at Ravenstones. And it was cloudy, but also a lovely sunny day. We stopped for the obligatory photo, standing on top of the Trinicle, and we followed the path west to Ashway Rocks, and we started south. Uh, we started southeastwards towards Ashway Gap. We walked past the Memorial Cross and just after some waterfalls and a little footbridge, we were on Dovestone Moss, Featherbed Moss. Now the path on top of there was quite nondescript at the time. So we had to take a compass bearing to walk along to get to Chew Reservoir. As we were walking across the moorland, the temperature started to drop and the visibility started to decrease to less than 20 metres. I felt a shiver go down my spine. A gentleman wearing tweeds, plus fours, a tweed jacket, a dirt-starker hat and brogues, with a shotgun broke over his arm, was there and he was walking towards us. Now, normally when you're out walking, people are very friendly. And sometimes you even get fed up with saying good afternoon, etc. to everyone you pass. This guy didn't respond to our greeting at all. He didn't even make eye contact with us. We all turned around and watched as he walked away into the mist. I put walked in inverted commas because it was more like he floated or he glided along. Considering the rough terrain, his movements were effortless. And within minutes, the mist had gone. The visibility had returned and it was a warm, clear, sunny day again. We talked about it on and off, but it was the usual teenage boy banter. We never really talked properly about it. 
and I don't think it was a gamekeeper. The person's style of dress was very old, very old fashioned, and even back then in the 90s, they were wearing jeans, modern boots, t shirts, barber jackets, wax jackets, old combat jackets, and modern waterproofs. There was no shoot on that day, to my knowledge. And also the way the weather and the visibility changed, it couldn't have been a coincidence. Our last report tonight is also our most recent, and I ask permission to share this with you, as it's a very personal story, as all of our stories have been tonight. I've spoken to people before who described seeing someone whose eyes were completely black, so I can attest somewhat to the level of fear that it instills. To see something that is almost a facsimile of a human must be horrifying. I cannot imagine what I would do if I was faced with an almost human with the blackest eyes that you've ever seen. How on earth do you deal with this as a child is beyond me. And my heart goes out to our next witness. Hi Deborah, I'm contacting you regarding an experience I had many years ago that still haunts me to this day. And I'm curious if you've heard anything similar. I grew up in the northwest of England and this incident happened when I was 9 or 10 in the mid-1980s, as far as I can remember. Every Saturday I would be forced to go into town centre to go shopping with my mum for groceries for the week. When we'd finished, usually about two, we caught the local bus home. This particular Saturday was a lovely bright sunny day and the town centre was bustling with people and my mother and I were waiting at the bus stop to catch the bus home. And at that time, Oldham got its first McDonald's restaurant, and all my school friends were talking about the milkshakes, and I really wanted one. McDonald's was just across the road from where we were waiting on the high street, and I asked Mum if I could run across the road um, to get one of an ice cream with my pocket money. Sorry, a milkshake with my pocket money. And my mum reluctantly agreed and she didn't want us to muss the bus and I ran across and I purchased my drink. As I left McDonald's, I stepped into the road and I was aware of lots of other shoppers around me but I was fiddling with my straw as I tried to get it through the lid of the cup. And this is where it gets odd. It felt to me like an old man dressed completely in black materialised right in front of me and I mean centimetres in front of me. I walked straight into him. I stumbled back to catch the remains of my drink and when I looked up to apologise, my blood ran cold. The man was elderly and he had a strange, pale, waxy complexion. His grey hair was brill creamed back and he looked like he was wearing the clothes of a Victorian undertaker. That is the best way I can describe him. His eyes were completely black and shiny and I was utterly petrified. I felt like he was looking directly into my soul. He glared at me for what must have been a few seconds, but it felt a lot longer. When I walked into this man, I hit him full on. I remember my nose hurting from the impact, and it felt like I'd walked into a block of freezing cold steel. It didn't feel like I'd walked into another human being at all. I didn't bump into the soft flesh of a person. It was like walking into a fridge. I remember backing off and uttering an apology for being so clumsy. And I ran over to my mum at the bus stop. I was shaking like a leaf. And when I asked if she'd seen the weird man, she said no. All she said was, I'd just seen you stumble in the road and you spill some of your drink. She didn't see him at all. I looked around to see if I could see him, and he would have stood out in those clothes, but he was nowhere to be seen. Now, as the years have gone by, the image of this man has never left me. I can see him as clear as day in my mind's eye. I did a bit of research many years later, and I discovered that the road on which I saw him on was on the main road from Oldham Parish Church, and it would have been the route that the undertakers would have used frequently. I wondered if he was a ghost or maybe a time slip where I had somehow intruded into a Victorian era funeral. I also wondered if I hadn't had an encounter with death. I have no idea. It is only recently that I've heard about the black eyed kids phenomenon and now wonder if it could possibly be related to that. I really have no clue. 
except it was very strange and it happened in a busy public place in the middle of a sunny afternoon when the last thing on my mind was anything remotely paranormal. Until next time, good night.